So a woman ran out of church on a Sunday morning during Christmas season. She was hollering at the pastor as she left, You've ruined my Christmas celebration! You see, um, earlier she had been singing Christmas songs with the rest of the congregation, and she had noticed a nativity sitting off to the side, and so she thought, I'm going to go look at that during a moment of contemplation in the service. And she went over to look at it, and she saw in this nativity was a blanket and, the, and the, you know, with a little uh, creche, the, um, the manger. And so she pulled back the blanket. And as she pulled back the blanket, underneath the bank blanket, to her disgust, was not a little baby, but a crucifix of Jesus Christ. And that's when she hollers out, You've ruined my Christmas celebration, Pastor, because he had dared to put the image of Christ on the cross in the nativity scene, which was where a baby was supposed to be. Would you be disgusted by that? The theme for this month is the cross in Christmas. The cross in Christmas. Christmas really has no meaning without the cross. If Jesus doesn't die on the cross and rise from the dead, Christmas, we wouldn't even know about it. He simply would be another baby born during the Roman Empire, and we would have already lost track of that story long ago. The birth of Jesus is significant because Jesus came to save us from our sins. That's his total purpose in coming, is to save us from our sins. In the early 20th century, tuberculosis was a terrible disease that was um, causing the death of people throughout the nation. <clears throat> Physicians were experiencing the first signs of success treating tuberculosis in special hospitals. They actually called them sanatoriums at the time. The one doctor who uh, was working in one of these hospitals wrote to his, his um, niece telling her about a problem that he had. The hospital only had enough money to keep going for another few days. If they didn't raise $300, the, the hospital, and this was a hospital in Delaware, was going to have to close down. So the doctor had written to, to Emily Bissell. Bissell was a veteran fundraiser, and she soon came up with a plan. She learned about this plan, by the way, from Denmark. Denmark a gentleman in Denmark who later was knighted for his actions had come up with the idea of doing something called Christmas seals. On the Christmas seal in Denmark was the picture of the king and queen of Denmark and the word Merry Christmas. So she saw this and thought, we could do that. So she went to the Red Cross and, and, and had t took with them a design that she had made. And the design was a red cross on the top, holly on the, beneath that, and the words Merry Christmas. The Red Cross said, that's a great idea, do it. But they gave her no money. So with her own money, she went out and got printed some of these Christmas seals. And she went to the local post office and she asked if she could sell them at the post office for one cent for 25 Christmas seals. Wow. One cent for 25 Christmas seals. Unfortunately, she had done all this printing, but she hadn't asked the permission of the postmaster. And at that time, there was no rule for putting extra documents, stickers, and stuff like that on the mail. So she worked up instructions and all that there was no post with this. It was just simply just a message put on, the, on an envelope. And the first day, she sold $25 worth of stamps. Amazing. The next day, it was $15 worth. And the third day, she sold none. $35 was not going to take care of re keeping the hospital open. Millions were being affected. Life was really getting bad. Tuberculosis was uh, just uh, harming many people. And so she knew she had to do something bigger. So she went to Philadelphia. When she gets to Philadelphia, she goes to a local newspaper and she tries to work up with, with the publisher. Could you put, put something in the, pre in the newspaper about this? He says, ah, no, probably not. Um, we, we don't do things like that. And so as she's leaving, she stops by at the desk of a gentleman who was writing for the newspaper. And she starts sharing the story with him. He says, 
this is great. We're going to make, I'm going to make this my subject for the month. And he goes back and he talks the publisher into it. They put it in the paper. Eventually people started buying. Ultimately, the president of the United States, who at that time was um, uh, President Roosevelt, even he bought some of the Christmas seals. And that year, to her surprise, they actually sold $3,000 worth of Christmas seals. Christmas seal with a red cross on the top of it. This was before the Red Cross actually had used that. Red Cross on the top and Merry Christmas. Now today, they're still are selling their seals for people. You can still buy it, although I went online to look this morning and it's too late to buy them right now for this year, but you can purchase your 2018. You still can donate, but it's just too late to purchase seals this year. This is done by the American Lung Association, and they continue to raise funds for their efforts, um, for research and all that. But take note, where did it begin? The story behind Christmas seals is about a woman who put a cross on a message that said Merry Christmas. When you, when you look at Christmas, a baby is not very disturbing, are they? Unless they're crying, right? then they might get a little bit disturbing, especially if they don't stop. And especially if you've been up with that child for many hours during the night and they're still not stopping, now that could get a little bit disturbing. But, but babies in creches, in nativities, in mangers, they generally don't bug us because they're like just laying there and most of them are simply dolls, aren't they? <laughs> a baby doesn't disturb anyone. But a Savior does. We're going to look at Malachi today, Malachi, the third chapter. Malachi foresaw his coming. He saw that the Messiah was going to come. By the way, this is still 300 years before Jesus is going to be born. And yet God's been revealing to Malachi the Savior is coming, and he's going to look like this. And in Malachi, he says, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire or, or a launderer's soap. In fact, let's look at the passage. If you have your Bibles, open them to Malachi. Uh, should be right near the end of the New Testament, if you're, I mean, of the Old Testament, if you're wondering. Malachi chapter 3. I will send my messenger. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll give you time. It's the Italian um, prophet at the, near the end of the Old Testament. Malachi, some people call him. That's not true, but a couple of you laughed. That made it worth it. So if you got to the right into the middle of the Bible, between the Old Testament and the New Testament, then you simply back up to the left a little bit. That's, that's Malachi, the last, last prophet in the Old Testament. And in chapter 3, it says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by. By the way, there's an assumption there, isn't there? Malachi is recognizing the fact that the offerings have become unacceptable to God. In fact, later in our very, the chapter we're looking at, we'll see that, that Malachi actually says that you are robbing God. Yes, there's stories of theft in the church. And the theft uh, happens maybe every Sunday. And it's people that choose not to give anything to God when God has invited them. Well, you can look at that later. So he says, so I will come to put you on trial. Whoa. I think I just skipped a verse, so I'm going to back up. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings and write... And in righteousness and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. 
I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I will send my messenger, Malachi says, who will prepare the way before me. Who does God send to prepare the way for his coming? John the Baptist. John the Baptist has a responsibility of preparing the way for the Messiah. And what's his responsibility? What's his job? To call the people to repentance. He says, look, you need to repent in order to get ready for the Messiah who's coming. Isaiah 40, verse 3 says, He is a voice of one calling, In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Jesus will actually quote that verse later, speaking of John the Baptist. Look at Luke chapter 1. It's the story of the, the birth of the Messiah. In verse 76, Simeon has come to the temple, moved there by the Spirit of God. He's been told, you're not going to die before you see the Lord's servant, before you see the Messiah. In verse 76, it says, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Simeon is prophesying over baby Jesus who has been brought to the temple for the purification rites after birth. Verse 77, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Why is this baby here? To forgive the people of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Now who's he speaking of? He's actually anointing John and praying over John. Matthew chapter 11, verse 7. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? That was definitely not John the Baptist. (laughs) No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? This is Jesus talking, folks. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one of whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. John the Baptist, prophesied by Malachi, prophesied by Isaiah. He is preparing the way for the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. Malachi goes on, The Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The Lord, the one that you're waiting for, this Messiah. And they don't know what the Messiah is going to be like. They're hoping that he's going to come and set them free from whatever bondage they're in at that particular time. And when Jesus is born, it's Rome. And they're hoping to get this occupying nation away from them. And so they're waiting for the Messiah to come. And, and And Malachi says, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. He's going to actually enter into the temple. Now, do you remember how many times Jesus came to the temple? Several, right? He came to the temple as a baby. As an infant, he was carried to the temple like John the Baptist was to be dedicated to the Lord, to be dedicated just like you did. He's brought, he did circumcision, and then he's brought in when his mom is pure. She's brought in with him, and they actually officially named the baby. When the time came, verse chapter Luke 2, 22, this is again right at the heart of the Christmas story. Verse 22, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Where'd they do that? At the temple. Now here's where we're talking about Simeon. I think I messed up earlier, but Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, As you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. 
and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Can you imagine being Mary? Uh, she's bringing in their little baby. She knows he's special. The angels have spoken to her. She believes he's the son of God. She doesn't know what all that means. But she's got her little baby like any mom. She's really happy. And she takes him up. It's kind of like you bring up a baby. And, and what do you do? Guys, girls, you, you forget it. It's not you. But guys, how many of you, when you see a baby, you say, oh, how cute. I said guys. I didn't say girls. Come on, guys. Be honest. How many of you guys really say, oh, how cute. Oh, this is beautiful. Yes. Yeah, well, most of us guys don't say that. <laughs> most of us guys, when we see a baby, it's like the guy who looked at a baby and thought the baby was ugly and says, yeah, that's a baby. <laughs> okay, now maybe if it's your baby, oh, yeah, it's cute. But, but you know what? Even for your own baby, sometimes they frankly don't look cute. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, they just, they're, they're babies, they're wrinkly and look like old men and old women and without any hair and all that kind of stuff, yeah. They look like you, Boone. No, <laughs> no they don't have beards, so. <laughs> so, so little babies. <laughs> so here's Mary, she's holding her little baby that she's proud of and she's just cuddling him and loving him and, and what does Simeon say about him? You know, Oh, he's beautiful. Oh, he's cute. Oh, he's such a darling little baby like all little babies. No, what does Simeon say? This child is destined to cause the rising and falling of many in Israel. What do you, what? Simeon, hold, hold on here. And to be a sign that would be spoken against. No, not my baby. Everybody needs to love my baby. So that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And the sword will pierce your own soul too. Look at this at the heart of the Christmas story. And you'll see this more than once if you look closely. What's, where, what's going to pierce her soul? What is it that's going to hurt her so much? Standing there that day watching him die on the cross. The cross is at the heart of Christmas. Jesus didn't just come to the temple as a baby. He came to the temple when he was 12 years old. Remember the story? Luke 2, just a few verses later. Luke 2, the passage that we all read at Christmas time, right? Verse 40 to 42. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. This is his time at 12. It's bar mitzvah time. It's time to be recognized as an adult young male. And so he goes to the Passover as well. In verse 49, why were you searching for me, he asked. You might remember the story. They lost him. They headed back to Nazareth. On the way back to Nazareth, two days journey away, they started checking throughout all the, the people that had gone from Nazareth, and there are probably quite a few hundred. And they said, oh my, we, Jesus isn't with us. And so they go back to, the, to Jerusalem. They look around Jerusalem. Finally, they go to the temple. There's Jesus work, teaching in the temple, talking with the re religious leaders. Why were you searching for me, Jesus asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Well, Jesus came to the temple several times during his ministry. In John 2, Jesus answered, verse 19, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. What's he thinking about? He's not thinking about that building. He's thinking about his body that's going to be destroyed and rise in three days. John 5, verse 14. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. When he's at the temple, he's thinking about sin, isn't he? Here's a man that he's healed. And he said, Now you stop sinning or something worse is going to happen. John 7, verse 14. Not until halfway through the festival... This is still at least a year, maybe more, before he goes to the cross. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. But then, verse 28, Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him. What did he come to do? 
he comes to put the nation, to put the world on trial. And here at the temple, he's putting the religious leaders on trial. Now move forward to John 8. And I'll read several verses from John chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. No one, sir, she said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What was the story? Jesus has just had a woman touch him, come up to him. Actually, excuse me, the woman brought to him. They want to stone her because she's been caught in adultery. Malachi says he's going to come and he's going to uh, con- He's going to put people on trial who are committing adultery. He's going to put sinners on trial. And here's this woman, and she's really being brought by the Pharisees who are simply trying to trap Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He says, whoever's without sin, cast the first stone. And eventually they all walk away. And then Jesus asks, "Now, now where's the people that condemn you? And she says, no one's here but you. The one that's still there is the one who has a right to throw the first stone. He's the one perfect one in the whole crowd. And he's still there. And now he says, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. And then he turns to the people and he says to them, because the leaders have left, he says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Look at where this all had taken place on the outside edges of the temple. Verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sin. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. <clears throat> Who are you? They asked. Just what I've been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you. That's why he came. But he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him I tell the world. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. Jesus is standing there at the temple. He's telling all these people, you know who I am? I'm the one who came to take care of sin. I've been sent from the Father. Verse 44, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's speaking of Satan, Jesus is. Not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Verse 58, very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, Watch out. This is stoning words. Before Abraham was born, I am. And he has just taken the Hebrew holy name of God that nobody says out loud. And he has just taken it on himself. And what did they do? Just so you know, as at this, they picked up stones to stone him. That's what you do with somebody who blasphemes. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. And Jesus came to the temple the final week, the week that he was crucified. Mark eleven fifteen. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it is, is it not written... My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus is coming back, and he came at this first time, and he's putting the world on trial. Notice what it goes on to say. It says, he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Those are a couple of interesting phrases. He will refine and purify the the. Malachi goes on, the very priesthood. He will refine and purify the Levites, those who are responsible for continuing the message of, of salvation through sacrifice. Jeremiah 9, 7, Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says, See, I will refine and test them, for what else can I do because of the sin of my people? The Messiah is coming to test us. Daniel 12, 10. Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. 
None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. Not everybody is going to believe that Jesus is the way to heaven. Not everyone is going to believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, that he is God who he said he was, and that he's someday coming again. Not everyone's going to believe that, but there will be some who will understand. And then Zechariah 13, 9, this third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver, test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. Now take note. When the Messiah comes, it says he's going to be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. How will that be a refiner's fire? Well, let me quote from one, one commentary. Messiah will be like a refiner's fire, an allusion to the process of purifying metal. A refiner uses a fire to heat metal to a modern state. Really hot, right? Then he skims off the, the stuff that's floating on the top, the dross as it's referred to. The refiner's fire is, of course, maintained at an extremely high temperature and such a high degree of heat is the prophet, until the prophet's picture of the testing people will face on Judgment Day. All judgment has been trusted to the Son. Upon Christ's return, the intense flame of God's judgment will purify the earth, removing the dross of sin. When the refiner's heating up the metal, he's heating up, or she's heating it up to a point when they get the metal hot enough, get the dirt off the top of it, and then what's the refiner looking for? To see their own reflection. By the way, I think there's a theological principle that God is trying to refine us, purify us, clean out the dross, the sin, the yuck, the garbage in our lives. And what does God want to look at us and see? He wants to see his own image when he looks at us. When he gets rid of the garbage, he wants to see his own image in us. And what about the other one? Now, this one's a strange one, isn't it? And the Messiah will be like the launderer's soap. Kids, you all learned a lot about laundry, didn't you? This... <laughs> Some of you already did laundry, but some of you didn't until you got here. Some of you got here and said, soap? How do we do this? You know, you had to ask for help, right? Or else mom helped you on the way when you came, right? So there's a responsibility. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ben's, yeah, okay. So do we have the, the laundry or soap? Well, it's interesting, but the, the, the word that's used here actually is for a form of lie, or we might even refer to it as bleach. What do you use bleach for? You use bleach to whiten clothes. And they actually had lye. They actually had a strong chemical soap that they created back in Jesus' day and before, back in the Old Testament times, that it would actually clean clothes and make them white. Now, by the way, if you haven't used bleach, be careful. It does worse things than make clothes white. You can actually deteriorate them, too. So just watch out. <laughs> So again, when the commentary says, when Christ returns, he will cleanse the world of all impurity. Every stain of sin will be scrubbed away. The account of Jesus' transfiguration contains a reference to his purity using language similar to Malachi's. He was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. There's the same soap. Look, when Jesus came and when the Holy Spirit comes upon him and he's up there on the mountain of transfiguration and they see Moses and Elijah and Peter has his run-of-the-mouth experience. And, and, and when all that's taken place, the Scripture says that he was, became white as, and no bleach on earth, no soap on earth could make him as white as he was as he stood there in front of them. <clears throat> I've got a quote Spurgeon at this point on this text. He says, if any of you, my hearers, are seeking the Lord at this time, I want you to understand what it means. You are seeking a fire which will test you and consume much which has been dear to you. It's one of the reasons why people don't want to accept Christ. I want to have my sin. I want to mess around, do all the fun I can do. At the end of my life, just before I go to heaven, then I'll get it right with God. But okay, now that's a waste. I'm going to warn you. But that's kind of the attitude. I'll get it right at the end, but in the meantime, I want to have a bunch of fun. And so we fear coming to Christ because I don't want to have to change. I don't want to have to stop doing things. Spurgeon goes on. We are not to expect Christ to come and save us in our sins. He will come and save us from our sins. Therefore, 
If you are enabled by faith to take Christ as a Savior, remember that you take him as the purger and the purifier, for it is from sin that he saves us. Jesus wants to make a difference in our life now. And so he wants to become a part of our life now. And yes, that might mean some refining, some purifying now, because he wants to save us from the things that that sin's going to do to us. And you ever feel shamed, guilty, embarrassed because of those choices you've made? That's the sin that breaks us. And Jesus said, look, I want to keep you from that burden. Revelation 3.18 Jesus is speaking to the church of Laodicea, a church that's not hot or cold. They're just lukewarm. They're just kind of there. It's like some Christians, or people who call themselves. In verse 18, it says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. There it is again. So that you can become rich and white clothes to wear. Here are both pictures, right? Purification from the fire and the clean clothes. So you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see to the church of Laodicea and to anyone who's just blah. He's saying, here, come, come to me. Buy from me what I want, what I have for you. What does uh, Malachi go on to say? He says, I'm going to put you on trial. Whoa, these are strong words. Look at verse 5. I will come to put you on trial. This is where, this is not nice talk in the church, is it? This is not seeker sensitive, is it? So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, against those who defraud laborers. By the way, what's a perjurer? Somebody who's not speaking the truth in a public arena. Anyone here lie? I think you fit in with a perjurer. Oh, by the way, just in case, no, I, if you haven't committed adultery, uh, if you haven't defrauded laborers, if you haven't uh, contacted um, sorcerers to try to speak to the dead, if you haven't oppressed widows or the fatherless, if you haven't done harm to anybody else who's in need, if you haven't been unkind to foreigners who needed justice, uh, if you haven't done any of that, did you ever think it? Because Jesus says if you thought it, you've already committed it. And he comes to put us on trial. John the Baptist, when he was talking about Jesus, he said, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers. That's a nice greeting, isn't it? <laughs> you snakes. What are you coming out here for? Who told you to come out here? Who told you the news? I, I, I don't even want you around. In fact, he says it this way. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. He doesn't need you. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into what? That purifying fire. Didn't Jesus talk about that same thing? Didn't Jesus say, if, you, if, if your branches are not bearing fruit, one of his, what is he going to do with them? He's going to cut them off. He's going to take them down. And in fact, uh, they're just good then for what? To be thrown into the fire. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not think you, excuse me, I jump ahead. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down, thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for what? Repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Jesus is coming, and he is going to put us on trial. And he did it when he came, and he will do it when he returns. But did you notice the one little phrase right there at the end? Did you see I skipped it? At the end of verse 5? So he's going to come, and he's going to put on trial. He's going to testify against all these people. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I don't know. He sounds kind of frightening to me, doesn't he, to you? 
If he's going to put us on trial, if he's going to test our behaviors, if he's going to look at the sin in our life, because I know I've got some, oh my, if he's going to do all that, that doesn't sound very good, does it? But he says, but do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. Do not fear the trial if you believe in Jesus. You don't need to be afraid of the trial if you've already accepted the payment for the wrong. If he's already taken care of the guilt, you don't have to be afraid of the trial. You've already been found innocent by his blood. So here's how he says it in John 8. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, verses verses 31 and 32, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. If you follow me, if you do what I say, if you do the things that I've taught, you really are my disciples, which includes things like loving one another, all that. So he says, verse 32, then you will know the truth, and the truth will do what? Set you free. Verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, then you will be free indeed. Whoever, verse 47, whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Watch out. That's, now there's that on trial again, isn't it? He's dealing with those people, though, even religious ones, who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And he said, if you do not belong to God and hear what God says, the reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. You don't need to be afraid if you believe in Jesus. And let me take you to the last book of the Bible. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. John is looking and he's seeing these incredible visions of the future and what's coming down the road. And he says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With, judge, with justice, he judges and wages war. When Jesus comes back, he's definitely not coming as a baby. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire. There's fire again. And on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, now watch this, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in white linen and clean Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He leads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus came the first time to die for our sin. Jesus is coming again. And he will put the world on trial. But those who know him need not be afraid because Jesus has already bought a place in heaven for you. He'll purify us like gold and silver. He'll get rid of the gunger, the junk, the sin. All of the dross will be removed and we will finally be free. Jesus, may we truly believe that. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would be cleaning out the dross, the gunger, the sin, even before you come back, Jesus. And I pray for anyone here today that has not believed, that has not said yes to you, that you would remind them and show them truth and help them to understand that you don't want them to to live in guilt or shame or embarrassment. You want them to be free to live and enjoy life. And I pray, God, that we would remember that that's what Christmas is about, the cross, your death and your resurrection. And we have a responsibility to share the truth of Christmas, the real message with the world around us. And if we don't, then we're also following that judgment that said we're not concerned about the foreigner, the outsider. So Lord, 
I pray that we'd have the same concern, the same burden that you do for the world. And I pray that not one person will leave here today without saying yes to you. And I thank you that you loved us so much that you died to pay the price of our forgiveness. In Jesus' name.